Okay, let's start. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour, hola. Miao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo. And hello all. And welcome and thank you, Sambis people, for joining us the 77th seminar. And I call it a UIUC day. I came back to home or stopped by home after giving four invited seminars in Germany, enjoying Paris with my college friend or my best, best friend during the Easter weekend and attending a Department of Energy meeting in Washington, D.C. to meet some colleagues there. After this seminar today, I will go back to Europe to give three more seminars and meet more people at ETH Switzerland, where actually today's junior speaker actually uh, affiliated, and University of Oxford, UK, and Imperial College London in UK. I try to minimize my flight trips to save my time and potentially reduce green gas emission, but my DOE meeting made me come back. Also, it is always good to be at home, although I enjoy meeting many and diverse people during trips. Okay, it is my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Professor Yong Su Jin. He is a professor at U University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. It's called also UIUC. Only within around three hours of driving distance from my home. In fact, I was kindly invited last year and I visited him to give a seminar and then went to University of Wisconsin, I believe, Medicine to give another talk at a conference and came back to home to finish around, I think, 14 hours of road trips. Professor Jean, as you know, is a pioneer in East Metabolic Engineering with a lot of DOE funding. As I said, I just attended DOE uh, meeting. In fact, his PNAS pa paper, that is uh, more than, I think, uh, 11 years ago, inspired me when I was formulating my job talk. That's great, you know, you know, paper, I mean, about, you know, uh, kind of carbon, you know, uh, transport into the East cell and then utilizing some, you know, metabolic pathway. Professor Jin, I truly thank you for your time and for your contribution to the scientific community and more importantly, inspiring me a decade ago and the virtual podium is all yours and thank you again. Thank you, Professor Moon. Can you hear me well, everybody? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, can I share my desktop so that maybe I can use a uh, PowerPoint I prepared? So, do you see my slide? I see, yes, I see your slide clearly. Yeah. So, you know, I know that you know we have a pioneer speaker to talk about five to ten minutes to give a insight or introduction to young people. Yeah, I watched a couple of previous video. And I was very uh, intimidated by the quality of the talk by the previous speakers. So humbly, I tried to prepare something. So hopefully, message will be taken well. So one of the uh, problem or one of the important decision as a scientist is to find the, or identify the research topic. So probably, you know, although I was uh, introduced as a pioneer, I, I don't think I'm a pioneer. Like we have uh, two types of uh, uh, research scientists in the field. First one is uh, like real pioneer who are look for impactful discovery, who are making a bold transition from comfortable research area to uncomfortable area. So they always look for new problem and find the problem, advance the field, and then move to another area. This is a real pioneer. 
And second type is uh, following the pioneer, but still you know, confirm the discovery by the pioneer and then further improve the, the findings so that the, the science can advance. So this is what I call expert. And I think we need both. But honestly speaking, uh, my scientific path was uh, as an expert. I was very uh, lucky or maybe I was not smart enough to be a pioneer. So I was uh, just uh, studying one problem, which was uh, jalous fermentation. I think I'm a very rare person who study same topic for master's degree, PhD, postdoc, associate, you know, assistant associate in MOOC4. So this is one big problem I was studying over 25 years. So as you know, we have a cellulosic biomass, then we hydrolyze or depolymerize this biomass, then we obtain the glucose and jalose and acetic acid. These are the pre -prevalent, three prevalent carbon sources, but the strain we are using for uh, biotech, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae cannot use xylose. So very simple idea, let's you clone the enzyme, introduce them into Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I was keep doing this thing for 25 years. So this is my master's, uh, the, the paper published based on my master's study. As you see, Jalos fermentation by recombinant you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then I moved to Wisconsin Madison. Then I was uh, trying to clone the third enzyme, which was not known at the time. So I cloned the enzyme and I identified what are the optimum expression level to get a Jalos fermentation. Later then I did the DNA microarray study to figure it out what are the gene regulation on the jalous condition as compared to glucose condition. Then I also happened to learn about this powerful approach called the flux balance analysis. So instead, you know, in addition to using uh, gene expression profiling, I was using this uh, flux balance analysis to better understand the jalous fermentation by engineered yeast. Then I move up to uh, MIT for my postdoctoral training. I was lucky or I was not smart enough to try, you know, so that I have to, you know, do a further study with the jalous fermentation. But this time I did a little bit of improvement using this uh, inverse metabolic engineering approach. So with uh, Professor Stefanopoulos, we thought about how to identify limiting enzyme. You know, if we know that initial pathway, initial assimilation pathway is known, how, how do we identify for the enzyme? So we developed this uh, called inverse metabolic engineering approach. And then I was very lucky to be a professor at the U of I. And then as uh, uh, Professor Tessa Moon mentioned, you know, we were able to further improve this shallow fermentation using a co-transportation of uh, cellular bios. So this was a kind of interesting discovery so that instead of using one sugar at one time, now we can input two sugar at the same time. So that was very interesting idea from, you know, inspired by this idea again, we tried to introduce like a gylose and acetic acid at the same time. So as you see here, you know, if we pretreatment to a pretreatment of hemicellulose, we obtain gylose and acetic acid. Then we found that this gylose and acetic acid can be co-consumed by redox coupling. So we made another interesting discovery. And then I became an associate professor. Then I was still thinking, you know, using this sugar fermentation. And then when I was doing this PNS work, we found that this cellulose transporter can transport other uh, disaccharide. So we are using that idea in order to make this uh, lactose import so that we transport the lactose, then we process them by rewiring the metabolic pathway, then we can make uh, uh, tagatose, which is a high value sugar uh, replacement. Then, uh, you know, I still keep doing this thing again. So this time I'm using this xylose and acetate co-utilization, but now I'm arguing that acetate can be converted into acetyl-CoA very efficiently so that the system is very good for producing acetyl CoA drive the product. So as you see, it's so one example is the three acetic acid lactone. You see that xylose and acetic acid can be co-consumed so that we can achieve a very high production of TAL. So, so this is uh, something I found, you know, the other day I did a search with the Scopus with the xylose and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then there are about 2000, you know, publications so far. 
then I was contributing already 91 publication. And then I'm the, the one who are studying this Jailos and Sakharova Serevije for the most. So that means I became an expert. I know, you know, it takes a time, but once you became an expert, then you can you know, contribute to the field uh, more impactfully. So finally, my suggestion for the young scientists is uh, uh, be passionate and enjoy what you are doing. I was very lucky to do this uh, yeast genome engineering and also metabolic flux analysis. And also I do a lot of fermentation. I make a beer and wine and bread. And recently I'm trying to apply what I learned for the engineering the microbiome for preventing and curing the disease. So, and also another important thing is, uh, you know, I couldn't do this without the people. You know, these are the people who did all the work I'm just uh, representing today. I really like to thank uh, my group members, former and pre uh, current members. And also I'd like to thank uh, my funding agencies. And finally, this is uh, something I really like to tell to young uh, scientists. Sometimes we care about uh, the credit. Or oh, can I be a second author, fourth author of the paper? But I think uh, this is really inspiring me. You know, I always try to read this uh, sentence whenever I work with other people. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. I think this is something uh, very uh, useful mindset to be a uh, successful scientist. I think this is what I prepared and then thank you for, you know, listening to my <laughs> humble presentation about, you know, research uh, topic selection. So I think we can move to the next session. I mean, do we have a kind of question and answer session here where we move forward to? Uh, I guess one? I mean, everything is so clear and we probably do not need to ask questions, but if you, you have any question, you could ask question later. Yeah, uh, I will stay, so. Yeah, so later or, you know, you know, send email to him. But that's absolutely, absolutely beautiful talk. And I still argue you are a pioneer because to me, the PNS paper actually guide me regarding my 10 years project since 2012, because that one I actually use in my job talk and job uh, idea in, in the proposal. And that one still kind of, I still remember that one. Uh, that was amazing. I mean, so that that paper basically to me, you you are pioneer. So. So you are very humble, so thank you so much. But I believe, you know, all the young people already got great lesson out of your dedication, deep, you know, insight into the one fear. And that is amazing to me. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank That's you, okay. thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, so now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Dr. Corentin Bryant received both his engineer's degree and master's degree in electrical engineering with spe specialization in control in 2005 from the Grand Noble Institute of Technology, France. Oh, I know France. He received a PhD degree in systems and control theory from the same university in 2008. From 2009 to 11, he held an SS research associate position in the SS Linus Center at the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden where he was working on the modeling of congestion control in large scale communication networks. So that means I mean, he is something, doing something not necessarily biology. From 12 to 17, he held a research associate position in the Department of Biosystems Science and Engineering at ETH Zurich. Switzerland, where he was working on the modeling, the analysis, and the control of complex biological networks. After holding consulting and data scientist positions from 17 to 20, he is a senior scientist back at 
ETH Zurich, both at the Department of Biosystem Science and Engineering at the ETH R Center, AI Center, where he is pursuing his research program pertaining to the application of mathematics, optimization, control theory, and data-based method to systems and synthetic biology. Interestingly, I came back to home, which is closer to Professor Jin, and tomorrow I will leave home to visit Dr. Bryce's advisor, Mustafa Hamashi, at ETH Switzerland to give a seminar. I will say what a coincidence. Correctin, you are also quite a traveler doing great research in many countries. Actually, I want it to be. And thanks so much for your time today and looking forward, forward to listening to your talk. And please take it away and thank you. All right, so thanks a lot for the introduction. And uh, I'm really happy to be here to be able to talk about uh, something I've been doing for uh, 10 years now. Uh, it all started with uh, some small idea, short project, which uh, extended and grew uh, over time uh, in a way that actually was uh, difficult to foresee. Uh, but in the end, actually, it all started by just playing around with a piece of paper and trying to uh, have fun with, with some problems. So, so yeah, so what I'm going to present is also some uh, joint work. So I'm not the, the only one uh, who worked on that and developed the results. Uh, uh, I will present today. So it's a joint work with people from uh, the group of uh, Professor Kamash. Um, so of course, I'm going to cite the people when uh, this is necessary. So so as I said, my background is actually uh, uh, not biology. I mean, I'm an engineering slash applied mathematician. So and my field is what we call control theory. So since I mean, I know the audience is not really on that, so I will just um, talk about that and uh, explain what it is. I will also explain how it, it relates to biology and what can be done by mixing uh, both of them all together. And then I'm going to present a very simple problem uh, and I'm going to provide like a solution, a mathematical solution uh, with some simulation and some uh, experimental validation in bacteria, plus some discussion about uh, the overall ideas and what uh, should be done or could uh, would be nice to, to do uh, in the future. So what is control theory? So control theory is a, it's a engineering discipline, then mathematical discipline, that um, uh, whose goal is to uh, control systems. So it's a bit a uh, tautology, but basically what we have as an example on the left side here, say that you have your, your, your car, and when you're driving your car, you want to regulate the speed. You want to maintain your car at a certain speed, uh, depending on the, on the limitation. And the way you do that is by just looking at the speedometer and just playing with the, uh, the gas throttle to adapt the speed, you increase, decrease it, or maintain to, uh, to, to a steady level. Uh, and nowadays we have cruise control in cars. So what we do now is instead of like uh, having the driver to do that, we just use a sensor called a speedometer. We compare that to a desired speed. So basically say uh, 50 kilometers per hour, for instance, we compare the current speed with the desired one and we'll fit that to what we call a cruise control, a cruise controller. So this cruise controller is an algorithm that is going to be implemented in some uh, computer inside the car that will take those measurements from the speed and the desired speed and transform that into an actuation on the system, which is here, the gas throttle. So it's just a basically some form of converter. And the idea is to just control the speed and to maintain it as a, a desired level. So if you look at the graph below, I mean, you have the desired speed in a black dashed line. So first is three, so arbitrary units here, three, then five, then two, then four. And in blue, that's, for instance, an example of how the speed, speed should, uh, should behave. So it goes from zero, let's stop, to three, stay there, then goes to the next value, five, and everything runs smoothly. But that's not the only uh, objective that we have, because we can have like disturbances. We can have like the environment can act on uh, the dynamics or the behavior of the car. So if, for instance, like the slope increase, but you can have also some uh, some wind or some other variation of the environment that will just change the speed of the system of the car. 
And so in that case, what we want is to have this cruise controller should be able to react in uh, that and to compensate for this change of speed and to drive back, as you can see on the right side, uh, to the uh, to the value, to the desired value for the speed. So here we have like an increase of slope, for instance. So the, sleeve, the speed goes down and then the controller should co co compensate for that and go back to, to go back to the desired value. So that's just an example. But then on the right side, we can make this a bit more abstract. I mean, you can just, make more high stuff in the sense that you can just send your car into a system. It can be anything that has an input and an output. The output is something you want to control. And the control input is something, is a way to act on the system. And that road slope is now uh, a disturbance, something that would disturb the process. So we measure the output with a sensor. Uh, and then we compare to the desired value for the output that we call in this case a reference. And then we compute again this error and we fit that to what we call a controller. Okay. And this controller, akin to the cruise control, we just convert the measurement and the reference into an actuation onto the system. And so control theory is like is the, is the mathematical tools and engineering tools to compute and decide what controllers should be uh, designed or used in a certain context, depending on the system, depending on the on the on the on the objectives we want to have. You can have different objectives depending on the difference of systems, and this actually is everywhere. You know, it's in cars, it's in planes, it's in, uh, it's in like incubators. It can be everywhere. It's pretty much like everywhere in a in nowadays. There's been a, it's actually a very transformative uh, technology because it has it it has allowed us to develop things that we would have would not been able to do. So we cannot just do. Uh, controlling systems in a better way than them because they are really fast. I mean, much faster than humans. They are very precise, much more precise than humans. And so, I mean, the idea of that is to, to try to to try develop new methods. But then we can just put the system you want here. It can be a plane, but we can put, for instance, to make a connection with uh, the previous talk is that you can put like a metabolic networks, okay? And the output is like the metabolite, you want like a biofuel, for instance. And the output is a biofuel we want to control. The sensor is a biofuel sensor. You have a certain set point, so I want to produce that amount of biofuel, for instance. And now is how do I design a controller so that I can maintain uh, the production or productivity of biofuel at a certain level, and maybe even better to optimize it. So, so that's to put a bit in context to, uh, to uh, with respect to the previous talk. So now, I mean, it's nice also to try to a bit to uh, compare a bit uh, what uh, what we have in control and biology. So. What I just explained before is the regulation problem. So the regulation problem, what do we want? We want to find a controller so that the output okay, goes to the desired value. okay, And we can also reject uh, disturbances. okay. So that's what we have here. So here, we just follow the reference. And here, we just compensate for changes in the environment or just adapt to disturbances. And in biology, we have like what we call biological regulation, of course. And there is like this homeostasis a concept that was found by Canon. Uh, almost like 100 years ago now, which is the ability of living organisms to regulate the internal state, which is exactly the same concept. Okay, We want to maintain certain internal condition to a certain value, regardless of the environment. So if you take, for instance, the example of like the human temperature body, you have to be 37 degrees Celsius constant, pretty much. And this regardless of the, 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 the air, uh, the temperature of the air around. So if it's too hot, then we just sweat to regulate. If it's too cold, we just burn more energy. Okay, so then we have perfect adaptation, which is the same, essentially the same idea. It said that it's more at the at the, uh, the value of like at the molecule and molecule level, so at the protein level. You want to regulate a certain like amount of molecule within a cell, for instance. So that's pretty much the same thing. If you take, for instance, like glucose regulation, uh, so this is the same thing. You want to maintain a certain glucose level in the blood, uh, and then if you eat something, you will have like a surge of like glucose in the blood. And then the insulin needs to kick in to regulate that. And then we just reject the disturbance, which is in that case, the meal. So we have actually perfect adaptation. Uh, so perfect adaptation is more is homeostasis, more at the physiological or molecular level. And so we see that the regulation problem and perfect adaptation problem actually are a completely equivalent. They are different names, but they, are, they represent the same problem, but one more is in engineering and the other is like more biology. Uh, and the conclusion from that is that we know, at least from control, that if you want to have regulation, the regulation doesn't come out of nowhere. I mean, systems do not regulate that you build, do not regulate themselves. We need to build a regulator on next to them so that they can behave the same way, in the right way. So that, for instance, if your car, your car doesn't drive automatically at the right speed. I mean, you need to put the controller so that it does that. So then, I mean, what, what, what we can extract from that is that in biology, we must have regulation motives. You know, they must naturally, necessarily exist 
So that, I mean, uh, biological systems can actually live and regulate the internal behavior. Right? So this is not new. I mean, we know that regulation is at the core of biology in a long time. This is, I'm not saying anything uh, groundbreaking here. But um, and so, but this is something that I mean needs to be I mean put it, put in context that I mean we don't really know um, necessarily how things are working, and this is actually what we have here. So the thing is that um, first of all we have like what you say endogenous networks, which are regulation networks, which are already there, already implemented inside the living organisms in ourselves, for instance. And, uh, and these are, have been quite well documented to some extent. So we have like negative feedback loops. Okay? We have like incoherent feed forward networks that can do something like that. I mean, the main issues are, and I put also where here because uh, this problem has been addressed since then. And we have more and more, uh, I would say, uh, solutions uh, or answers to these questions, but still, I mean, some work is still is still needed to really under fully understand that. So, so the thing that very often is that we could take like a, like a like a circuit, like a genetic circuit with RNAs, protein DNAs, everything, whatever, and uh, you could like observe that one of the molecular species, say your protein, will exhibit perfect adaptation properties. It will just go to the right value, and if you pair to the network, then it will go back to this value. You see. But the question is, because it's nice to see that, but sometimes many people were just stopping there, you know. And the reason why it's problematic for me is that, or at least for us, is that we don't know why is is the case. So what does what are the underlying mechanisms behind this behavior? Okay, uh, and then also what part of the network is responsible for this behavior? Because you could imagine that there wouldn't one part in the network that would just be some kind of system, and one part of the network that would act as a regulator for the for the for the system. Okay. And very often with this analysis, I mean, this dichotomy or this, this separation between the two parts was not really analyzed. And I think this is something which is very interesting, at least to me. And so control theory is exactly the type of theory that uh, has been built to address uh, those kind of questions. Yeah. So in this case, I mean, if it can, uh, control theory can help understanding uh, existing or endogenous networks. But then if you look at more on the synthetic networks, right? So, uh, so basically using synthetic biology, which we would say that it's the engineering part of the field when you want to design circuits, okay? Then here, I mean, what could be nice would be to create or discover new uh, controller circuit, new regulatory circuits, okay? Uh, and so again, control theory has been developed to achieve this kind of task. I mean, that's been developed for um, designing such, such controllers, but the problem, it has not been uh, built for applications or for uh, for biology, I mean, it has been built for electrical engineering, for making for robots, for aeronautics, for everything. So we have that. But then, when we want to apply that to biology, then we realize that it's not really adapted to this kind of problems. Yeah. So that brings us to cyber genetics. So cyber genetics is exactly what I, I so you're basically filling the gap. In that. So it is a control theory and all the mathematical tools that is dedicated for the analysis uh, and the control. Uh, in a systems and synthetic biology setting. Okay? So the idea is like twofold. So one time on one side is what you want is to be able to develop mathematical and computational techniques okay, for understanding those control problems. Okay? Uh, and then it's also to provide tools for the implementation of the solution. So it's only okay, how to implement that using like building, so designing building blocks so that you have like building blocks like that you can implement in terms of like chemical reactions or even plasmids that can implement such controllers. Okay, And then you can just put inside the cell with the hope that you will be a able to regulate um, the, the network or the, the, the part of the cell you want to regulate. It is also a very quantitative approach in the sense that you really want we want we really want to put numbers onto that. Uh, it's important to, to put numbers to quantify how fast I mean you can uh, regulate a system, uh, or also to put like limitation in terms of if you want to uh, control like certain levels of some proteins inside the cell within some bounds. Otherwise, if you go out, uh, that would be maybe toxic for the cell, for instance. So we need to. Uh, would like to have also some quantitative approach. So putting like numbers uh, onto that. So this is a bit difficult because uh, it, uh, it, cl it it clashes a bit with the problem that uh, biology or it's, it's not a very clear field in the sense that we don't really know exactly how things are working quantitatively within a cell. So that's also a difficulty that we have here. It is also a very bottom-up approach in the sense that very often, um, in many, you can see many papers where, especially in mathematical biology, that people are just trying to fit onto biology what they know or what they extrapolated from some other field. 
And in some sense, it doesn't really match the biological problems because it's just, it sounds a bit too artificial the way it's done, you know? So it's just basically, I just know how to do that and I would like to apply it to biology, so I'm doing that. But then it, you, in this case, when doing that, you miss a lot of uh, technical details or the inherent limitations to uh, the, the limitations that are inherent to biology. So in that case, the idea was really to start really from the biology and the different like constraints and limitations that we, we have and just build what we can do from that, okay? So first of all, I mean, you need to have solutions that can be implemented in terms of biological components, so RNAs, proteins, or other building blocks. Uh, I mean, we know that cells are inherently noisy, so we have to also be able to cope with that. Um, we need to have also some circuits um, that should work, even though we don't really know what's going on inside the cell. So the, the substrate, the cell, is actually uh, not very well known. Uh, it also, you have a lot of context dependence, so we don't really know uh, um, the state the cell is going to be, so we have to have a circuit that would work regardless of that. Uh, also, another thing is that also we have not like unlimited energy. I mean, you have to build circuits that will just use some energy, but also uh, not use too much because we will rely on a, um, on the existing energy, on a, on, a, on a amino acids, on the ribosomes and everything. So you don't want to perturb the cell too much. Otherwise, you can just like uh, either kill the cell or you can just, the cell can also evolve to, um, to basically escape. So basically evolve by favoring mutation on the circuit that will favor evolution of the, the cells in which um, the circuit is uh, inactive. So then we have to just build upon all these kind of ideas. So it's adapting ideas from control to cope with these kind of constraints. So of course, we have other constraints, but uh, I wanted to, to mention those one first. So yeah. All right. So Let's start, this is a, a simple problem to make things a bit more concrete. So on the right side, we just have the very simple gene expression network. So we start from DNA, we have transcription, mRNA, translation, protein. Okay, we have RNA polymerase and ribosomes. So just to have an example, is just to make things easy, is that we would like to, to control that system. So what we want, we want to, for instance, uh, act on the transcription level. Uh, so that the protein uh, concentration, for instance, uh, will go to a, a certain value, desired value, like the set point. And you want that to be uh, the case, uh, even if you have changes into like uh, translation rates or degradation rates uh, in the in the in the system. So, so that's what we see. I mean, on the uh, at the bottom, on the left side, actually forget about like this uh, green and blue on the back on the background. I will just go back to that later. But this is a bit of a spoiler of the main result. That's what, but this is what you want to have. So in the black dot again, that's the set point, the reference. That's what we want to have for the protein. So first is four, then six, then three, and you can see that the protein levels, like in red, goes to the value. Then you change the set point, it goes there, and then it goes down. It just follows there. And on the right side is going to be the perfect adaptation. Where in this case, what we do is that you select set to three, uh, the, the, the level for the protein, and then we just uh, decrease the degradation rate of the protein. So of course, when you do that, uh, the protein copy number, the le protein level will increase, but then the controller should, should kick in at that case and just drive back the protein level to the value free stimuli. So that's perfect adaptation. And on the right side is also the same thing, except that when translation uh, is increased uh, for, for that thing. So now the question is that, how do I design a controller uh, that can that can achieve that? Okay. So the main step that we have is just we work in the framework of reaction networks. So in that case, the reaction network is the gene expression network. We have three molecular species, the gene, the mRNA, and the protein, and then we have four reactions. Okay. So the first one is the some transcription reaction. Uh, we just produce one more RNA from the gene. Uh, then we have the degradation or dilution reaction for the mRNA. You have the translation that creates one protein from the mRNA, and then you have the degradation of the protein. And each reaction has its own right, transcription right, degradation right, translation right, et cetera. So then on the top of that, of course, we can put mathematical models. Uh, if you're in a deterministic case, you can put differential equations. If you're a stochastic model, you can put jump Markov processes, for instance, which are very good for uh, modeling uh, noisy behavior in, in, in cell. But then, so that's pretty much like the, the setup. So, so that, and then with that, we have mathematical tools and techniques to just use that for designing controllers. So of course, I'm not going to detail that. That's not the point. I'm going to jump straight to one of the possible solutions to that problem. 
So in that case, what we do is that we just adjoin to the to the to, to the network, to the gene network, uh, what that we call the antithetic integral controller. That is another uh, reaction network that consists of two molecular species. I would say ZA and ZM. ZA is for A is for activator, and uh, M is for uh, measurement. And you can see that we have four reactions. Okay, so the protein we want to control is in yellow. This the the measurement species that M is in blue, and the activating or actuating species is in red. And we have these four reactions. So the first one is you can is a measurement reaction because you can produce one of these molecules that M in blue at a rate that is going to be proportional to the protein. So this is basically some kind of measurement from the system. And conversely, you can see that the rate of production of the mRNA, which is the second reaction, is going to be the transcription rate. In that case, is going to be proportional to the population or the level of this uh, uh, activating or uh, actuating uh, molecule. Then we have a third reaction called the reference reaction that is very close, uh, I'm sorry, which is going to be associated with the set point. Okay, so by changing this value here, we can just change the set point. I will get back to that a bit later. And then finally, we have like the very important comparison reaction where ZM, ZA and ZM is, must be complementary to some extent and must, must bind with each other. So this, I call it comparison, but you have titration, we have annihilation, we have like, it's also like a, a sequestration reaction that has many different names. And that's actually the key uh, behind uh, behind this controller. This is a very important thing. And also, it also puts some limitation in the sense that the molecules are you going to use if you implement this controller, ZN, ZM, they must be binding to some extent. So this is really something which is important. And I will just impose a lot of restriction on the type of systems or molecules you can use in that case. So then we can just have like uh, theoretical results. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just explain the difference between the deterministic and stochastic case. So the thing is that if you do the calculation in that case, which I'm going to skip, then we can show that in the controller here where uh, all the parameters uh, can be tuned, then we have this perfect adaptation property only if K and eta uh, satisfy some constraint, okay, that I'm not going to explain, but you have to pick them. So you're not free to pick whatever you want. Uh, you can have problems if you don't pick uh, uh, them in the correct way. But if you do, then uh, the set points, the, the protein level, Okay, that's going to be the concentration of the protein is going to converge or to go to this value mu over theta. And again, mu over theta is just this ratio from the reference reaction, the rate of the reference reaction over the rate of the measurement reaction. So which means that with mu over theta, you can change the set point. And then if K and eta are chosen correctly, then the concentration of the protein will uh, reach that value. So in some sense, that's not, I mean, it's interesting to have that because it's a very simple network and a very simple network, I mean, is working for that gene expression network, but it's also way broader in terms of applicability. This is just an example I'm giving, but it's working on a lot, a lot of more complicated uh, systems. As long as some uh, conditions are going to satisfy, this is gonna, going to work. Um, so in the stochastic case, however, uh, what can be done is that it can be shown that in this case, you don't need to have conditions on this value k and eta of the controller, okay? As opposed to uh, the deterministic case. So that's very interesting and that's very surprising to have that. And we call that a noise induced property because it's a property that's only present uh, when the noise is actually present. So this is actually, uh, this was actually a big surprise. Uh, in this case, the set point is still going to be mu over theta, but uh, the convergence is going to be a bit, a bit different. What's going to happen is that now if you have a population of stochastic cells, okay? Uh, and every single cell implements its own controller, the antithetic integer controller, okay? And then you put the same mu theta everywhere. Then if you take the average of the fluorescence or the of the of the of the or the the levels of the protein, this average across the population is going to be equal to this mu over theta. So it's a slightly different concept of convergence or tracking than in the deterministic case, but it's actually uh, something that makes sense. I would say when you look at a cell population, especially when you're uh, in a stochastic setting. So of course, I mean, this has been proven for uh, certain classes of network and we, this is still mostly an open problem to, to show that it's gonna work at least mathematically, uh, that is going to work in more complicated uh, uh, systems. But um, yeah, so yeah, just to summarize uh, maybe, um, 
so the the the, the, the left uh, top left and right is what I saw shown at the very beginning of my talk. So that's exactly the result of simulations when you just uh, take this gene expression network and you just connect this antithetic and control, uh, controller to it. So in the backside now, I can tell you that it's two uh, traject uh, trajectories of two different cells. So the two cells are very noisy, okay? They evolve this way. But if you simulate now southern cells and you take the average of the molecule of the protein copy number, that's what you get is the red curve that is following exactly uh, the um, the profile, the tracking profile you want to have. Okay. And on the right side is exactly the same thing, but for per the perfect adaptation scenario, you're not like tracking a set point anymore. I mean, at least you're not changing it, but you have a fixed set point and you want to be able to counteract uh, the effect of uh, disturbances onto the system. So the one in the middle is just to show like what I said before, the difference between the two, uh, the condition between for K and eta in both cases. So as I said, the deterministic case, um, K and eta needs to be chosen appropriately. And in this case, what it means is that it has to be taken below that curve here. Okay? So if you take it below that curve, you will get like the, the graphs on the bottom right, where the deterministic trajectory is in orange, you see, we start from zero and we converge to the desired value, which is normalized here and it's one. And the mean trajectories of the stochastic setting, so the average over a cell population in that case, uh, will also do something similar and converge to the, the desired value. However, if you change, change the parameters in a way that you go above that curve, okay? So above that curve, this condition for the deterministic case is not satisfied anymore, but for the, the, the stochastic case, it doesn't matter because there is no, there is none. So you can see that in this case, the deterministic trajectory is not converging and we'll have uh, oscill sustained oscillations, okay? While the trajectories in the cell population will uh, be actually converging, but also very similar to the one uh, in this region. There is very little difference in the end. So we can see that this very simple network I just exposed, I just presented with two molecular species, four reactions. I mean, you have stability and convergence. Stability here means that you don't go everywhere. You know, the trajectory are, are just bounded, for instance. Um, uh, we have set point and reference track or reference tracking, and you also adapt to changes. So this is exactly what we wanted to have. So in some sense, uh, this small circuit provides a solution to the perfect adaptation problem for uh, some classes of reaction networks. So now, I mean, let's move to some uh, experimental results. So I'm, I have not done that. This is taken from a paper by Stephanie Aoki. Main, the main authors are Stephanie Aoki and uh, Gabriel Ilacci, and they are both in the Kamash lab in uh, ATR Zurich. So, so the idea was to implement this idea, so this controller here, but in bacteria. And, uh, and the choice for the complementary uh, molecules here uh, is for the use of sigma factors, which are well known for, uh, for uh, responses in bacteria, regulatory response in bacteria. So let's go through the uh, the open loop and the closed loop set of first before talking about the results. So the system that we want to control is going to be the bottom right here. So we want to react, we have, the input is on RSC, and you want to control the levels of RSC uh, to which we have like a, a, a green, uh, a green uh, pro, uh, fluorescent protein tagged to it so that we can measure. Okay. So the top top right here is a, a model for the disturbance. Okay. So if you activate uh, MFRON through ATC, you will repress uh, the levels of uh, RAC and GFP. Okay. So if you don't have that, I mean, you reach a certain level. If you have that, it's going to go down. And this part is just like a way to activate uh, the system. So if you put HSL here, you can activate that and start producing RAC. So that's the open loop network. So now let's go to the closed loop network. So the closed loop network is exactly the same, except that we add another layer, another model, say. Okay. And this other model is uh, something that will be activated by the protein we want to control. Okay, so that's exactly the same thing as before. So here, I mean, it's basically my RSIW is going to be my measurement species. Okay, this sigma W is going to be my activating species because it's going to activate and or activate the system. We can modulate this rate here with RSC. So that's pretty much my theta, uh, the theta rate of uh, parameters. This SSL is going to be the mu, and here we have this combination reaction because these uh, sigma factors are complementary. And this is just the reaction here. So that's exactly uh, what I represented be uh, before in terms of a chemical reaction network. So now we can play around by putting that training with error, HSL, and ATC, and to see what's going on. So in the open loop setting, what we have, so we have like different levels uh, of uh, array. So here it doesn't really matter. But then like every uh, 
couple of bars is a different uh, set point. So we have different HSL here and there, here and there, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the red one is when you have no perturbation, so there is no ATC, so this is gone. So you reach a certain value at steady state, so it's stationary value uh, that is normalized, so it's, it's one. And then you just put like some ATC to that. So obviously this, this MF loan is repressing the levels of RSC, you expect a decrease in fluorescence, which you observe there. On the other hand, if you look on the closed loop system, then you see that uh, the controller is able to compensate for this reduction that is induced by this MF run by just increasing the production of, of RSC automatically. There is nothing to be done. It's the same condition uh, as in this one, except that the controller here is able to regulate uh, to to uh, to regulate to the desired set point, which is a perfect adaptation property. So that's a stationarity, and this can be also observed. Uh, by time series data. So that's the same. So we have in the open loop case, we have the red with no perturbation. So when there is no perturbation, then you stay at the same level. But if you put the perturbation ATC, so MF run is like triggered and start repressing RSE, uh, and then you just go down, okay, uh, as expected. But when the closed loop case, what you have is that in this case, we can see that the controller is also able to react and control back the levels of RSE to the desired set point. So we can see that in this case, we have not only you can do uh, set point tracking, because if you, if you change the set point here, it's a very different set point, you go to that set point. So this shows uh, set point regulation, but it also shows uh, perfect adaptation because you go back to the, the correct levels, the right levels, even in presence of uh, disturbances. So this actually is very, uh, very, very interesting that uh, something driven by uh, just a, a simple mathematical idea uh, could be uh, um, could lead to such uh, interesting result at least on the experimental level. So of course, I mean a lot of progress has been made. Um, so this is like the simplest one, also the first one along those lines that was obtained. So of course, I'm not going to go into details, but this is just to show that many people or many uh, many designs uh, have been developed okay uh, especially what i want to emphasize here is that a lot of this design rely on this uh, this annihilation or comparison pair like that was into here there 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 so it's a very fundamental reaction uh, and so some technologies or some existing methods then you use that for either, either your protein based RNA based in bacteria in mammalian cells you have different um, i would say molecules that are already existing uh, that can be used to implement this uh, comparison reaction that is a key uh, for regulation in that case. So yeah, as a, okay, now I'm pretty much at the end of uh, my presentation. So um, yeah, so the thing that what I wanted to show here is that I mean some ideas from control, uh, especially integral control in that case, could be used uh, in a realistic way uh, for uh, synthetic biology, and for and with the hope that. Um, perhaps um, the role of a control, of control engineering control theory in, uh, in systems and synthetic biology will be as successful as it is in the other engineering disciplines because it has allowed it to do a lot of things. Uh, many things, I mean, as I said before, we have not been able to achieve, uh, possible to achieve without that. So maybe uh, as the uh, circuits are growing in complexity, maybe more and more of this regulation mechanism will be necessary uh, to ensure that they are going to work the way they, they want. And so, uh, so in turn out that actually this circuit that we came up with uh, has some uh, endogenous implementation, which is not very surprising to some extent because it's a very simple system. And I would be really surprising that uh, living organism would have not evolved to develop such mechanism to regulate internal behavior. So it's actually it's interesting to see that. So what's also interesting with this point of view is that we can with mathematics, we can also uh, come up with designs that are not very easy to see with the naked eye or by intuition. And so this can help us to understand and say, okay, oh, by the way, we can see it there, 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 and there. So that I think can help us to also to decipher a little bit uh, complex networks and the role that some part, some part of the networks have. And so what I want to say to uh, finish with is that, I mean, a lot of problems are still open in the field. Uh, I think it can be like mathematical, can be like a computational, so for simulation. And uh, so this actually is very interesting because I mean, the, we, we are not that many people working on that. And uh, I think we are trying to attract more and more people in the field to, to help uh, because it's a huge effort. A lot of things can be done. And I think, uh, I think at least is a personal point of your opinion. And I think the problems are really interesting. And uh, what is also I would like to especially emphasize is especially on the implementation side, 
So like developing the experimental tools, like the building blocks. So for instance, uh, establishing or creating new pairs that can bind with each other to, to, to allow for more flexibility into the implementation and not necessarily re rely on, uh, on endogenous systems that you have to take from one organism and put another one. So if we can come up with, uh, uh, like I would say, tailored pairs, uh, depending on the application would be interesting. And speaking of applications, of course, this is something that there is not much. Uh, to be honest, there is almost none. At least, like I would say, only, uh, at least not only every experimentally, but also at the uh, industrial level, I would say. So, and the potential application would be like bioreactors, for instance, or even the, as I said before, the metabolic control and optimization. For this case, what you could do is that take a like a metabolic network that you want to dynamically control. So it's not like a static optimization because you want to correct in real time. Vari variations and perturbation or something. So you want to cope with uncertainty uh, so that we can just maximize the, the fluxes somehow um, over time. And uh, and this despite uh, variability in the environment. And of course, you can also do some optimization if you want to have some bioreactors, we we'll say like clever or smart bioreactors that we just, where in the cells, we have like some kind of smart cells inside that can optimize by themselves what they are produced using like simple uh, regulatory networks uh, the, uh, akin to the one I just uh, talked about. And um, yeah, so I mean, in terms of open problems and research work or something, I wrote a recent re review paper uh, that I mean, exposing a lot of like issues uh, in the field is cyber genetics and noise, et cetera, and, and also suggest some open problems and potential solutions. So it's something that is explaining a bit uh, um, where it would nice for a bit where it would be nice to go in the future. And there's also this very nice paper with Vital and Strumpf that are talking about limitations of mathematical tools and biology, which also is also in the same line as actually what we are doing. So all right. So with that I would like to thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take uh, any questions. So. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask, you know, Professor Jin whether he has any question or comment. Yeah, I think this is uh, very interesting. Um, but honestly, you know, I could understand some part, but I lost some part. But overall, I see a big picture. I think uh, this is interesting problem. I have one question as a non-expert. So this is uh, like a like a mathematical or mechanistic model. It's great, beautiful, because if we have this, we can have insight. We can understand things better. But now, if we look at the field, especially in like a computer vision or like you know car navigation, automatic control, now they are using what they call like machine learning or deep learning based model without this kind of equation, rather they collect a tremendous amount of data, feed those data into a black box and train the model. The model can do things, you know. So what do you think? I mean, here, you know, you are talking about this very beautiful small scale mathematical model, but do you imagine that, you know, something, you know, deep learning based approach for the control can be also applied for a biological system in the near future? All right, so that's a very good point because it doesn't, I mean, there is a big part of the field of cyber genetics that I've not talked about. Uh, it's called like the, so that's what I presented is like what we call in vivo control, in vivo because you just implement controllers within cells. But there is a huge effort, which is for in silico control, where controllers are implemented within a computer. So in that case, what you do is that you use like, for instance, like optogenetics techniques to act on the cells using like light. And you can act on the cell in the same way. I act my and my control is going to be inside the like program that can just decide what light to shine on the cell so that they can produce uh, like the biofuel level you want. So in that case, what can be done is that you can have uh, all these like learning methods, like data-driven methods, which is something actually I'm planning to uh, push a little bit forward in the future. It's like to avoid the use of modeling completely and to just work directly on the data, and based on the data decide what's the best to um, to um, you know, what's the best action to make to control the system. And in biology, this is especially important because first of all, we cannot have a clear model of the system because the complexity grows extremely quickly. So you forget about that. So that's true that the mechanistic model is something that right now 
it's not something that is viable. It's not scalable, at least. You know, it's working for small system, but as long as you scale up, then the complexity blows up and you run into many different problems uh, that are not, I would say, reachable um, with the current uh, technological level that we have. So in this case, what can be done uh, so we have to relegate that to like a like a machine, say, so we can just measure data from say your bioreactor, for instance, and with the data you can adapt in real time, which is really good because the model is the problem. The model is that there are something which is static, you know, it doesn't change over time. But the cells are highly evolving over time; they just replicate, they have mutation, they think. So you have to keep track of the changes of the system. And I think all these data-driven methods they are actually really good at that to adapt to the system and its evolution over time. So yeah, that's actually from a, I would say like an engineering point of view, that would be the most viable solution. Okay, thank you for your answer. Okay, wonderful. So I'm checking some question from audience. I'm asking one question. You know, I I done some control theory for very minimal level a long time ago. I still doing some. The one question I love dynamic controller. And this type of integral, you know, controller, whatever. One problem for the implementation in biology is speed of response, as you know. So if you have transcription factor based or you know transcription and translation based you know, control, th that takes delay and problem yes. is how gonna we make circuit that respond quickly enough for the perturbation. And then can you comment on that part? So yeah, but this is essentially like an implementation problem. Uh, so as I said, this is also very, I mean, this system is actually a kind of fast. Uh, it's, it can be shown to be also faster when it acts, uh, not at production levels, but at degradation levels. So when mm -hmm. you tag, for instance, molecule or something using like, for instance, you could do that with tagging like RNAs with micro RNAs for the degra faster degradation, for instance, it's actually very fast to that. So this really depends on the technology you're using. By technology, I mean, here's it like RNA based or protein based or something like this, and the way you act on the system. So this actually, there is no clear answer. Uh, there is some, Right now, in some works that we did, and some other people we tend to suggest that um, acting on degradation has a lot of properties in terms of speed of response, mm -hmm. uh, but also in terms of noise reduction. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, of course, those are driven by a, a simulation or something so far. So this remains to be validated experimentally. That's it. <laughs> that's sure. uh, because both simulation and mathematics is one side, reality is another. So. <laughs> sure. Of course. Thank you. Uh, I. Don't see any other question. And then I also see my, my clock 11 or two. So let me close and then we just have, you know, informal chat afterward. So, okay. So thank all for joining and staying today. We'll meet again on April 27, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Chase Baser at Helen Holtz Institute for RNA-Based Infection Research, Germany. In fact, I, where I recently visited to give a talk, and Professor Rodrigo uh, Ledesma Armano at Imperial College, London. In fact, that is also another university I will visit uh, next week to give another talk after my Oxford seminar. Uh, as usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. Please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speaker. I'll promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty faces if you wish. And thanks. I'm stop recording. Just give me one second. Uh,